reading of God's Word. Eyesight is a gift, isn't it? It's a blessing to be able to see. And we're blessed. I see a few of you are wearing glasses. And That's a blessing. I remember when I was a kid, I so desperately wanted to need glasses. I thought glasses were pretty, pretty cool. And I still think they are, even though I don't need to wear them. And I remember when my sister uh, was referred to an optometrist to have her eyes checked. She was having some vision issues, and, and she needed glasses. And I remember dropping hints after that to my parents, hoping they would think I needed to go to the optometrist. But evidently, I didn't need to. But I so wanted glasses. There was one time as a kid where I got to wear glasses, it was when I was in high school. And in high school, we were having a banquet. And as a young man, I was going to be taking a young lady to the banquet. And all the boys at the school were trying to be creative in what they were doing, getting ready for the banquet. And so one of the things we came up with is we were going to, those of us who didn't wear glasses were going to wear glasses, and those who did wear glasses were not going to wear glasses. So we just swapped. And so I got a friend of mine who wore glasses. He loaned his glasses to me for the evening, and he went without his glasses. And it was an interesting experience eating, not being used, not being used to, to glasses. And, and of course, um, his glasses were uh, for him, prescribed for him, for someone who needed glasses, and I didn't. And I just remember trying to eat my food, and it kept feeling like the fork should be to my mouth, and it's still not. You know, it looked like it was right there, but it was still a foot in front of me, and it was quite an interesting experience trying to eat wearing glasses that were a much stronger prescription than, than I, of course, would need. Vision. Now, we talk sometimes about 2020 vision, and that simply means that you're able to see at a distance of 20 feet, what good someone with good eyesight is able to see at 20 feet. So 20-20 vision is simply just normal vision, having normal vision, having acuity, the clarity and sharpness at 20 feet as someone with normal eyesight. If you have 20-100 vision in an eye, that means in order for you to see with the same level of acuity, sharpness, and clarity that someone with normal eyesight can see at 100 feet, you have to be 20 feet from whatever that object is. So you have to be 80 feet closer with your eyesight to see what someone with normal vision can see clearly from 100 feet. And of course, it could be the opposite. If you had 2010 vision, that means at 20 feet, you can see clearly what someone with normal vision can see from 10 feet. So your eyesight is almost twice as good. So this 2020, we sometimes talk about that hindsight is what? 2020, where we think uh, that uh, you look back on something, you're able to see something more, more clearly. You know, if you're struggling with eyesight, you can go to an optometrist and a simple vision test can determine if you need a stronger prescription, or if you need glasses. You know, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. We think of physical sight, but there's also spiritual sight. What are we able to see with eyes of faith? And while if there's a challenge, a problem with our physical sight, we can go to an optometrist, we can have our eyes checked out. What do we do spiritually when we're struggling to see God. This morning in Sabbath school in the, the teen class, we were talking about how can we believe in a God we cannot see? How can we believe in a God we do not see? And when we think about our faith and our spiritual perception, how can we know if our spiritual eyesight is 2020? Or if we need to go to the heavenly optometrist and have our prescription reevaluated, how do we strengthen our eyesight? I'm going to invite you to spend a few minutes with me this morning in the book of, book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, that highlights for us some spiritual principles that we can apply to our spiritual perception. Spiritual principles that we can apply to our spiritual perception to enhance 
our spiritual vision. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 11 is sometimes called the faith chapter. And here in Hebrews 11, we have highlighted some of the great heroes of faith from the Bible, beginning with Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham, and the list goes on and on and on. Men and women of incredible faith who saw something that others didn't see, and they lived their lives for that invisible reality, which was the kingdom of God. But here in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to look together at the first few verses of this chapter. This is in the context of faith. Paul has shared with us stories of great heroes of faith from the Bible, from the Old Testament. And now he says, therefore, we also, those of us living now in his day, but also a message applicable to us today, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he's speaking metaphorically about all these heroes of faith who have come before us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Jesus is the one we should look for. But the reality is for us today, we cannot with our physical eyes see Jesus. We don't. So how is it that we're able to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, if we aren't able to see him? Paul uses the metaphor of, or the analogy actually, of the Christian experience being like a race. We're running a race, and as we're running the race, we should set aside the stuff that is weighing us down, which is sin, and we should run with endurance, looking ahead to the finish line, looking ahead to Jesus. As you and I are living the Christian life, we need to be living our lives looking for and looking to Jesus Christ. And the analogy of the Christian journey being a race, I think, is an incredibly helpful one. Some of you perhaps have run a race, Maybe when you were a kid and you ran foot races out in the playground at recess time at school, um, I remember when I was a kid, I had a friend of mine who was always challenging me to run, and I liked running as a kid, and I usually would beat him. And he would always say, well, there was a reason I beat him. It's because I started too early. Or he said, um, uh, you have shoes that are newer than my shoes. And the shoes have a lot to do with how fast you run. I remember once he got a new pair of shoes, and he says, I'm going to beat you now because I have a new pair of shoes, and we ran, and I beat him. And he says, ah, I know the problem. He says, it only works the first time you run in a new pair of shoes, and I have already run wearing this pair of shoes before. And so that's why you beat me. Running. Many of us have enjoyed running. Maybe you have run in a 5K or a 10K or a half marathon. I think there's at least one individual here in our church this morning who has run a half marathon, uh, maybe even some who've run a marathon. Running is a good analogy for the Christian experience. And here in Hebrews chapter 12, we find that Jesus accomplishes three things for us as we run as a Christian, as we live the Christian life. First of all, Jesus is the example who inspires us. Jesus is the example who inspires us. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, we look unto Jesus. Jesus is the example who inspires us. There's always a motivating reason why we do something. 
I remember when I started running again as an adult. And what motivated me to start running again was that my conference, the Georgia Cumberland Conference, was the title sponsor for a marathon, the Chattanooga Seven Bridges Marathon. And so they were going to be the title sponsor for this marathon. It was going to be called the Seventh-day Adventist Seven Bridges Marathon, which is pretty catchy, isn't it? A little bit lengthy in name, but um, yeah. So they were the title sponsor, and they challenged the pastors to run it. Well, I didn't feel I was up to a marathon, but I thought I can at least do a half marathon. And one of my church members was a runner, and he was going to do the full marathon. And he and I together decided we would use this as an opportunity to raise money for our church school. And so we got sponsors and um, people who were sponsoring us, and it was contingent on us finishing the race. So a bunch of people said, we're going to sponsor, and if you finish the race, Pastor, we are going to donate this amount of money to the local Adventist school. So that was what inspired me. That was what motivated me to run. So I would get up in the morning, I would go train, preparing for this half marathon, and I did so because I had something motivating me. I wanted to make sure that I didn't embarrass myself, not finishing the race, after I had publicly said I was going to run this. But more importantly, I wanted to make sure the school got the money that people had committed to give. As Christians, there's something that motivates us, and that's Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the example who inspires us. As we get a glimpse of Jesus and we begin to understand his love for us, it inspires us to live a life following him. Jesus is the example who inspires us. But he accomplishes something else for us. If you're running a race, and the longer the race you're preparing for, the more important it is your preparation, it's helpful to have someone who's a trainer. Now, you may not have to go out and hire someone to train you, but it can be helpful to have a training program. You know, I, I chose the couch to marathon training program, which meant you're starting from the couch. You're not really running regularly, so couch to marathon. I've run three marathons uh, in my life, and, and that was what I would do. I would do the couch to marathon training program. So it starts with assuming you're not running at all. And so this day you run maybe a mile, and then the next day you take the day off and you're laid up in bed. And then the next day you run a mile and a half, and then maybe the next day you only run half a mile. So you start off easily, a little bit slow, but then as you progress through your training program, you're running more and more and more. And you're getting up to the point where every week you have a long day of running, and that long day gets up to 20, 22, 23 miles, and you're running on the other days a week, maybe 2 to 5 to 10 to 12 miles a day. And as you're training, you're preparing for the race. It can be helpful to have a trainer. And as Christians, Jesus is the trainer who prepares us. In verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible states, We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance. How is it that we develop endurance? It's through training. And Jesus is the trainer who prepares us. He is the one who teaches us. He is the one who challenges us on those days when we don't feel like living the Christian life. He's the one who's there beside us saying, don't give up. Keep on going. My strength is sufficient for you. And he is the one who is, is training us. You know, that training also in, involves uncomfortable moments. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 32, it says, When we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. This training involves correction and challenging us. Jesus is the one who corrects us and disciplines us. 
In fact, the Bible says he's like a parent who corrects or disciplines the child that he delights in. And sometimes we feel like maybe God takes too much delight in us. We feel like he's correcting and disciplining us too much, but that's his job. That's the role he takes as the trainer who is preparing us. In a sense, the life we are living is the race. It's the Christian life that we are living. But there's an ultimate challenge. And for us living in the last days, it's the time period right before Jesus comes when there will be the ultimate test of whether or not we stand faithful to Jesus. And so today, he's training us. Jesus is the trainer who prepares us for the challenges and the difficulties that come ahead. When you're racing, when you're running, it's helpful to have a goal in mind. A friend of mine, uh, Jim Slater, he is a Ironman. And so he participates in an Ironman triathletes. And uh, an Ironman involves swimming, uh, it's a few miles, maybe four miles, I can't remember exactly what it is. I think it's, it's uh, several miles, two miles, yeah, swimming two miles. And then you bike a long distance, maybe 100 miles, 90 some miles, and then you finish off by running a marathon, 26.2 miles. So you do that over the course of, of a few hours, uh, maybe more than a few hours, depending on what it is. Um, and you have all day, this starts early in the morning, and you have all day to accomplish this, and to, to qualify as an Ironman, you have to finish in a certain number of hours. It might be like 16 hours. I don't, I don't know for sure. But my friend Jim is an Ironman, so he runs these, or he swims and he bikes and he runs these Ironman events, and he's done a number of them. But I remember him telling me what it's like when you're running this final 26.2 miles, and if you're, if you're someone who is fairly proficient at this and isn't just trying to drag yourself across the finish line but is actually wanting to to accomplish it in a set amount of time he says you want to pace yourself so that when you cross the finish line you have nothing left you leave it all out on the track you finish with giving it all you have he says and that can be challenging to accomplish because when you're running 26.2 miles and, and having run a marathon, you, know, you don't see the finish line from the start. And, and you don't even see the finish line from a mile away at times. It depends on the course you're running. You may not see the finish line until a quarter of a mile or less before you get there. And so it can be a challenge to know how to pace yourself. But he says, as you're running the race and you're getting closer and closer, you begin to sense that you're close to the finish line because you hear something. You hear people shouting. You might hear some music that's being played and an announcer that is, is, um, is announcing who's crossing the finish line, but you hear people cheering and clapping and shouting, and so you know you're getting close. You don't see it, but you can hear it. You know you're getting close. As we think about living our lives as Christians, there are times when we don't see the finish line. In fact, we can't see the finish line, can we? We don't know when Jesus is going to return. We don't know how close we are. But as we get close, we begin to sense that we're getting near. There's some evidence that we're getting closer to the finish line. And that challenges us to run a little harder. That challenges us to put a little bit more. It challenges us to use up all the strength we have to cross the finish line well. And Jesus is the one who is with us through that experience. Because not only is he the example who inspires us, and the trainer who prepares us, but Jesus is the cheerleader who encourages us while we run. I remember what it was like running my first marathon up in Holland, the Holland Haven Marathon. And I started out the race with my brother-in-law and ran with him for about 26 seconds. And then 
he was the one who was on faster ahead, uh, and I, I was settled into a little bit slower pace. But I remember how wonderful it was running to go across, to pass crowds of people who would cheer us on. And, and people would be, yay, you got this way to go. And um, you'd see the same people across the race because people were focused on one or two people they were cheering for. And so you would be running maybe a similar pace as a few other people. So you would get their people cheering for you or for them would also be cheering for you. And then they would jump in their cars and they would speed down to another part of the course and they would be there to meet you again and you would get cheered for it. And that was significant and that was inspiring. What meant the most was when I saw these three faces, my wife and my two kids. And they would be there on the course, and they would be cheering, and they would be, you got this, honey, or, yeah, honey, and uh, the kids, you, way to go, dad, and I'd give them high fives, and, and that was wonderful, and that was a boost, and of course, when I would see them in the distance, I would run a little faster, you know, I want to look good for the wife and kids, and then I would get past them and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> slow down a bit, um, but they were my cheerleaders. I remember one of my church members who made a big sign and um, it was like mile 20 or 21 when it started to get a little bit of a grind. And I, I, there was Art Grimes, and he was holding up a sign uh, for me and cheering me on. That meant a lot, having someone cheering, cheering you on. Uh, I remember getting to the final couple miles, the final few miles of the race. So it's mile 23 and 4 and 5 and 6, and there's nobody cheering because the last few miles nobody's there because they want to be at the finish line. And when the people they're cheering for are getting that close to the finish line, you know, after mile 20, 22, maybe you don't see anybody. And those are the most challenging miles. But everybody's at the finish line because they want to be there to cheer for you when you cross the finish line. And so now you're running without anyone cheering for you. And it, it gets a little challenging. There's something about people cheering you on that makes a real difference. Jesus is the cheerleader who encourages us. We've already read verses 2 and 3, back to Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read them again. We, we are looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. What does the cheerleader do? The cheerleader keeps you from getting discouraged. And who do we need to think about so we don't become discouraged? Jesus. We should consider him and what he went through. We should look to Jesus, his example the life he lived of his love for us that encourages us, that encourages us in the race of the Christian life. Jesus is our cheerleader who encourages us. As we are running the Christian life, as we are living for Jesus, we want to recognize his example inspires us. So we got to look to Jesus. He is the one who trains us and prepares us so we need to spend time with Jesus and he is the cheerleader who encourages us. So we find ourselves in the most difficult parts of our Christian journey. We need to look to Jesus and consider his life and his example. And that will help keep us from being discouraged. 2020 vision. We want to see Jesus. And as we run the race of life, we need to be looking constantly to Jesus. But why don't we sometimes? I think there are three reasons, three reasons that Christians sometimes don't look to Jesus. The first one is looking to Jesus necessitates taking the focus off ourselves and others as well. And sometimes we want to be self-absorbed. We want to look at ourselves. We want to be focused on what we're accomplishing or not accomplishing, how challenging our life is, or how better it is than someone else's. There are times when we don't want to look at Jesus because it means we have to take the focus off ourselves. In fact, in that wonderful little volume, Steps to Christ, Ellen White notes that actually the, the closer we get to Jesus, 
the more sinful we appear to ourselves. And so sometimes perhaps we don't look to Jesus because we don't want to really face up to our true spiritual condition. So Christians don't look to Jesus because it means they have to take the focus off themselves to look to him. It also means they have to face up to their true spiritual condition. And so when you and I don't see Jesus, speaking with our spiritual eyesight, when our, our view of him has gotten a little dim, it may be that we are choosing not to look at Jesus because we're being so focused on ourselves that we don't have time to look to him. There's another reason I've noticed that Christians don't look to Jesus because looking to Jesus removes our gaze from the things of this world. And it's a big, beautiful world out there, isn't it? There's a lot out there to attract our attention and distract us from Jesus. And oftentimes, followers of Christ aren't looking to Jesus because they're distracted by the things of the world. There's a lot out there that's good. There's a lot out there that God has put there to bless us in the lives we live. But there's so much in this world that distracts us from Jesus. And whether it's our careers, or whether it's people's opinions of us, or whether it's whatever it might be, you know what it is that most easily distracts you from Jesus. Sometimes we don't look to Jesus because we're too busy looking at everything else. But there's a third reason as well that we don't look to Jesus. And that might simply be we don't know how. We don't know how to look to Jesus. We can't see him, not with our physical eyesight, and so we are not sure how to look to Jesus. So I want to share with you three biblical principles that can be helpful for looking to Jesus and seeing Jesus when life is difficult. When life is challenging, when it doesn't feel as if God is there or coming through for us, and we want to see Jesus, but we don't seem to be able to find him. It reminds me of a trip that my family and I took some years back. We went to visit Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon in Virginia, there overlooking the Potomac River, is the home of our first president, George Washington. And uh, the kids, I was going to say the kids were younger, all of us, Linda and I were younger as well. Um, we went to visit Mount Vernon, and uh, we enjoyed seeing the house and the other buildings there on Mount Vernon, walking around, even the tomb of, of George Washington, which is there on the grounds of Mount Vernon. We enjoyed all that. And, and then a storm came up, and so we spent the last part of our trip, of our time there at Mount Vernon in the museum. And there was a museum that we enjoyed going through. And uh, you go in at one part of the museum, and it's designed that you weave your way through and you come out the other end. So it's kind of like a one-way trip through the museum. And we started at one end, and as we're making our way through, we came across a diorama of Fort Necessity. Now, Fort Necessity was a fort in what is now Pennsylvania that George Washington built back during uh, colonial, uh, the colonial era. This was well before the American Revolution. This is when he was in service to his king, and he was leading a group of, of uh, uh, militiamen, and I guess there were maybe some British regulars as well, to go out and see what the French and the Indians were up to out on the frontier. And so he built Fort Necessity. And being the military genius that he was at that time, he built Fort Necessity kind of in a swampy area that was in a low area and was a difficult area to defend. And um, as you can imagine, it didn't go well when they were eventually attacked. But this wonderful diorama was quite large. It was probably the size of the, of the piano or even bigger. And it had the fort and it had all of the, the people attacking the fort and it had the, the Americans and the, the British soldiers in there who were fighting back. And it was really exciting to look at and it really captured Gavin's attention. And so he spent quite a while looking at that diorama. And then we continued on our way and Gavin said, can I go back and look at the fort? And so I took Gavin back to the fort, and he just stood there. They even had a little stool that, that kids could stand up on to get a better view of it, and he just gazed at it. And he probably spent a good, over the course of our time, probably half an hour, 
standing and looking at, at Fort Necessity. It had captured his interest. It had captured his interest, and he loved to look at it. And here's the reality. You and I are going to find it difficult to look to Jesus and see him if he hasn't captured our hearts. He has to capture our hearts. Otherwise, it's just going to be a constant struggle to look to Jesus. But once Jesus captures your heart, it's easy to see him. It's easy to look to Jesus. You know, it's a little bit like when you buy a new car. You buy a new car, and then you're driving down the road, and suddenly you see that car everywhere. Have you noticed that? You buy a Toyota Camry, and yes, it's the most used to be the most popular car in the United States. I don't know if it still is. Um, and you don't see them all that often, and then you have one, and you see one everywhere because you're looking for what you have. You buy an F-150. That's what Gavin's going to buy someday. And um, suddenly you see them everywhere. Well, of course, it's the most popular pickup in the United States. But whenever you, you have something you have, you begin to see that thing everywhere. As a parent, you have kids and you go to a crowded place where there are a bunch of kids, and who do you see first? You pick out your kid, except for the times when you think they've disappeared and you can't find them, and you're looking for them frantically, and they're standing right in front of you, um, but that hasn't happened to me, of course. Um, but maybe, maybe you've experienced that. But yeah, we, we, we see what we look for. And so when Jesus has captured our hearts, we're going to see him, we're going to find him. We're going to look for him. So I want to suggest to you three ways to see Jesus. First of all, look for Jesus' providence in your trials. Look for Jesus' providence in your trials. When you're going through a difficult time, intentionally look for small, they might be minute reminders that God is with you. You might be going through an incredibly difficult health experience. Maybe your health is challenged and you're going to doctor's appointments after doctor's appointments and, and your health is, is, is failing. But through that experience, it'd be wonderful to experience miraculous healing. But absent that, look for small reminders of God in your life. Maybe it's the nurse who offers to pray with you or the person in the waiting room who you overhear talking uh, in a faith-affirming way, or someone who's, who calls you up and says, hey, I know it's been difficult and challenging. Uh, I just want you to know I'm thinking about you and praying for you. Those are little providences. And so when life is rough, look for Jesus' providence in your trials. And if you're looking for it, you'll begin to find, you'll begin to find reminders of Jesus being with you and you'll see Jesus. A second way, look away from present circumstances to your greatest joy, eternity with Jesus. There may be times when you're looking for little evidences of God's providence in your life in the midst of trials, and you may not find them. They're there, but you may not notice them, even though you're looking for them. So instead of looking here, look to the future. That's what Jesus did when he was hanging on the cross. Paul says that Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, he had to look ahead. He had to look ahead to the eternity that his death was going to provide for you and me. And you and I at times need to do the same thing. We need to look away from our present circumstances to our greatest joy, and that's eternity with Jesus. So think about what it's going to be like when Jesus comes again. Think about what it's going to be like to see Jesus for the first time face to face. Think about what it's going to be like when Jesus says your name, your new name, because he's going to give you a new name. That's what the Bible says. He's going to give you a new name, and Jesus says your name, your new name, and he envelops you in a hug. As a kid, I thought it's going to be just incredible to get to heaven and sit on Jesus' lap and have him put his arm around me and tell me a story. I don't know if I'll sit on his lap when I get to heaven, but I'll sit next to him at least, and he can still tell me a story. So think about what it will be like spending eternity with Jesus. It's okay to look ahead. So we look in the present. Do we see little evidences of God's blessing and presence with us? 
and, and we'll find them. We look for them. They might be small in the midst of the challenges we're facing, but he's there. We look to the future. We look ahead to eternity and what it's going to be like to see Jesus. But there are also times we need to look to the cross to see Jesus' love and strength. There are times when we need to look back to what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that's what Paul says here in verse 3 of Hebrews 12, consider or think about him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Looking back to what Jesus did for us on the cross, that can give us encouragement and strength to see him in the darkest moments of life. Because what you're going through now, it might be challenging to grapple with how is God loving me and caring for me in this difficult moment of life. But you can look back to the cross and know, even if I don't understand why I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with now, the challenge I'm facing now, I don't know why God's allowing that to happen. I can look back at the cross and say, I don't understand, but I know he loves me. I don't understand, but I know he never leaves me. I don't understand, but if he was willing to give up everything to save me, he's not going to lose track of me now. So in the dark moments of your life, look to the cross to see Jesus' love and strength. Look in the present for his providences. Look to the future for what it will be like to spend eternity with him and look to the cross to see Jesus' love and strength. We need to see Jesus. We need to see him. As we look forward to the soon return of Jesus, there are some dark days between now and then. There are going to be some challenges between now and then. There'll be moments when we feel like giving up between now and then. We need to see Jesus. So are you looking for Jesus in your life today? Are you looking to Jesus? He's there. And you will see him if you will look for him. I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn, hymn number 412. We'll sing all verses, hymn number 412. Let's stand as we sing together.